asked some questions. I've been asking the kids questions each week, and I've had some treats for them. And so uh, we're going to see what they remember, and I'm going to ask them a new question. But uh, first, uh, just again, this is the one we've asked each week. And so uh, Quinn's not here, so you've got a chance. <laughs> All right, so we are looking at Psalms, and Psalms are... What kind, I hate this, I don't know, what kind of literature, right? They're not, they're not it's not a book, it's not a story. Uh, what is it? What are Psalms? Anybody? It's a praise book, good. Now let's, let's focus on the little ones here for just a moment. Any of our little ones know? Any of our little ones know? Raise your hand. Brian? Songs? Songs. All right, you can come get a treat. Come on up. Now, remember what the name Psalms means? There you go. You are welcome. Is, who remembers what Psalms means? Anybody? A, all right. Okay, Jim. A song sung on stringed instruments. All right. Okay. Now I'm going to just ask one more question, but you got to listen, all right? And this is for the kids first. Little kids first, not big kids. All right. So I'm going to read. So you got to pay attention with your ears, okay? Psalm 51, I'm going to start with the title. Psalm 51, it says, To the choir master, a psalm of David, when Nathan the prophet went to him after he had gone to Bathsheba. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love, according to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. Now, which one of you can tell me who wrote this psalm? Who wrote this psalm? Little kids first. They're afraid to answer without getting confirmation. David, good job. Come on up. All right, my big kids took a bunch of stuff, so we'll see if we got anything you like left. Good choice. All right. Okay, so Joe, they're all yours, brother. No. I'm going to eat the rest of the candy is what I'm going to do. <laughs> well, good evening. I appreciate the opportunity to uh, get to speak to you all tonight. Um, looking at Psalm 51, tonight we're going to deal with a very difficult subject. And it's a subject that a lot of churches don't deal with today, won't even talk about today. And that subject is sin. So this psalm is David's reaction to sin, and we're going to go back and look at uh, the reason for this uh, psalm and, and the reason why his heart is broken over this. But how many of you, show of hands, would like to have your sin written down for people to read for 4,000 years? <laughs> Anybody? Anybody want your sins written down? Just me? I was just leading by example. Nobody. How often do we like it when we get confronted on our sin? When somebody points it out to us? Never. Because we like to put on the face that, you know, we got it all together, we've, we're doing the right things, you know, we never sin. Well, really, that's a sin because we're lying to ourselves because we always sin. That's our sin nature. That's what we do. So, before we get into the uh, psalm itself, uh, since you got your Bibles out, go ahead and flip back a few books to 2 Samuel. And we're going to be in chapters 11 and 12. I'm not going to read the whole thing, just going to give you some highlights here as we... Uh, get the background for this psalm. Um, so 
So starting in chapter 11, verse 1, In the spring of the year, the time when the kings go out to battle, David sent Joab and his servants with him and all of Israel, and they ravaged the Ammonites and besieged Rabbah. But David remained at Jerusalem. And it happened late one afternoon when David arose from his couch and was walking on the roof of the king's house that he saw from the roof a woman bathing, and that woman was very beautiful. And David sent and inquired about the woman, and one said, Is this not Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah, the Hittite? So David sent messengers and took her, and she came to him, and he lay with her. So we we'll jump down, verse 6. So David sent word to Joab, Send me Uriah, the Hittite. And Joab sent Uriah to David. When Uriah came to him, David asked him how Joab was doing and how the battle and the people were doing and how the war was going. Then David said to Uriah, Go down to your house and wash your feet. And Uriah went out of the king's house, and there followed him a present from the king. But Uriah slept at the door of the king's house with all the servants from his lord and did not go to his own house. Skipping ahead to verse 14. In the morning David wrote a letter to Joab and sent it by the hand of Uriah. In the letter he wrote, Set Uriah in the forefront of the hardest fighting, and then draw back from him, that he may be struck down and die. And as Joab was besieging the city, he assigned Uriah to the place where he knew there were valiant men. And the men of the city came out and fought with Joab, and some of the servants of David among the people fell. And Uriah the Hittite also died. So now we're going to jump over to chapter 12. <coughs> Starting verse 1, the Lord sent Nathan to David, and he came to him and said to him, There are two men in a certain city, the one rich and the other poor. The rich man had very many flocks and herds, but the poor man had nothing but one little ewe lamb, which he had bought. And he bought it up, brought it up and grew it up with him and his children. And he used to eat of his morsels and drink from his cup and lie in his arms, and it was like a daughter to him. Now there came a traveler to the rich man, and he was unwilling to take one of his own flock or herd to prepare for the guests who had come to him. But he took the poor man's lamb and prepared it for the man who had come to him. Then David's anger was greatly kindled against the man, and he said to Nathan, As the Lord lives, the man who has done this deserves to die, and he shall restore the lamb fourfold because he did this thing and because he had no pity. And Nathan said to David, You are the man." Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, I anointed you king over Israel, and I delivered you out of the hand of Saul, and I gave you your master's house and your master's wives into your arms, and gave you the house of Israel and of Judah. And if this were too little, I would, have add, I would add to you much more. Why have you despised the word of the Lord to do what is evil in his sight? You have struck down Uriah the Hittite with the sword, and have taken his wife to be your wife, and have killed him with the sword of the Ammonites." So we see the reason for David's sin, we see the action of David's sin, and then we see the confrontation of David's sin by Nathan. So before we go ahead and look at the rest of our text, let's just take a moment of prayer. Father, again, we just thank you for the day. Father, this opportunity to gather together to learn from your word, Father, to pray for one another, to lift up one another, to be an encouragement to one another. And Father, we ask that as we look through this passage tonight, that you allow us to examine our own hearts, Father, to see where sin is, and Father, to identify that sin, and then plead for forgiveness for that sin. Father, you know my need as I come before you tonight. Father, I just ask that you would be with me as uh, I present your word. And Father, that everything that is done and said tonight will be pleasing and honoring to you. We ask this in the name of Jesus. And amen. Okay, so let's go ahead and flip back to Psalm 51. We're just going to roll through this uh, verse by verse. We're going to combine a couple verses as we go uh, for time's sake and just for continuity's sake. Um, so we're going to start at the beginning uh, to the choir master, a psalm of David, when Nathan the prophet went to him after he had gone to Bathsheba. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love, according to your abundant mercy. Blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. 
So we look at these first two verses and we see David's heart. He's crying out to the Lord. Have mercy on me, O God. Yeah. He's crying out because of the Lord's steadfast love and his abundant mercy. When we are confronted with our sin, when we are convicted of our sin, where can we go? Who else do we have to turn to? Go to the Lord. Who's able to forgive us of our sin? The Lord. We have to cry out. We have to take this verse to heart, this according to your steadfast love and according to your abundant mercy. Where sin abounds, grace much more abounds. Is there any sin that we can commit that God is not able in his mercy to forgive if we come to him with the right heart, a penitent spirit? No. So we see David crying out here in his, in his pain, in his anguish, when he's confronted with this sin, what he's done. You know, he should have been out at the battle, but he stayed behind. He was supposed to be out doing what kings do, but he was taking it easy. So that was his first sin. He wasn't doing what he was supposed to. His second sin, he looks at Bathsheba, desires her, sends for her, takes her. Second sin. Third sin, he tries to cover it up by getting Uriah home to go and see his wife. Fourth sin, none of that works. He has Uriah killed. And there's a fifth sin as a consequence of all this. The baby dies. So he has a lot to be praying about. He has a lot to be forgiven of. Yeah. You see his anguish. You see his heart. And he goes to the only place he can go, and that's before the Lord. So let's look at verses 3 and 4. It says, For I know my transgressions, and my sin is ever before me. Against you, you only, have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight, so that the Lord may be justified in your words and blameless, I'm sorry, so that you may be justified in your words and blameless in your judgment. So David, we see his confession in this. He knows his transgressions. And where is that sin? It's right in front of him. He's carrying it. It's eating at him. It's on his mind all the time. You know, it's ever before me. He can't get away from it. Can we run from our sin? We can try. Did Jonah try to run from his sin? He tried. He ended up in the belly of a fish. When our sin is pointed out to us, when we are confronted with it and we acknowledge it, we've got to do something with it. We can either carry it or we can give it to the Lord. So we see David's heart here. He knows his transgression. His sin is ever before him. Verse 4, against you and you only have I sinned. So we just went through the back story here. Did David only sin against God? No. No? Sin against, sin against a whole bunch of them. Yeah. His people, because he wasn't leading as he should. Bathsheba, Uriah, himself, his wives. Then why would David say, against you only have I sinned? Scripture wrong? Who had authority over David? God. When we sin, and we sin against other people, who are we really sinning against? God. Whose laws are we breaking? God's laws. So we see here, when he says that, against you and you only have I sinned, you know, God was the only authority above David in the country. It was God's law that David had broken. Were others affected by his sin? Absolutely. Did he sin against them? Absolutely. When we sin, we have a tendency, if I do something wrong to Norm, I've done something wrong to Norm and I ask him to forgive me. 
But how often if I sin against Norm, do I first go to God and ask him to forgive me and then come to Norm? So usually when we think of our sin as we sin against somebody else, we go to that person, ask them for forgiveness, and we're done. Yes, I've sinned against you, Mike, but I've really sinned against God first. Who should we go to first when we sin? Our first stop should be going to the Lord. And then obviously going to that person that you've sinned against and asking them for forgiveness. When we sin, not only do we have consequences against the person that we've sinned against, but we also have consequences of our own. When we have that sin in our life, when we break God's law, we break that relationship that we have with God. How do you restore a relationship? You go to that person, right? And ask for forgiveness. When I've broken God's law, when I've sinned against God, I have to go to God first. That's where my heart should be first. And then to the person I've sinned against. See, when we only truly realize that our sin hurts God first, can we really take that sin and internalize it? Then can we truly understand that weight of sin? I'm afraid that in our country today, sin is taken very lightly, if at all. It's not thought about. It's rarely mentioned. And we don't really attach the weight to it that should be there. We see David crying out, you know, have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love and according to your abundant mercy. He realizes the weight of his sin. We have to be able to recognize the weight of our sin when we commit it. Uh, and we've got to ultimately go to God first for that forgiveness. And that's who we need to seek at first. Uh, verse 5 says, Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. So does this mean that David's mother had a illegitimate relationship? No, absolutely not. This sin that he's talking about, uh, this doctrine of sin, universal depravity, is that sin that was presented to us in Genesis 3. When we see the fall, when we see the sin of Adam that is passed on then from generation to generation to generation, his mother did not have a sinful relationship, but being a son of Adam, he's sinful. For us being sons and daughters of Adam and Eve, we're sinful. That's our first reaction. That's our nature. As that's passed down from generation to generation, <coughs> our first instinct is to sin. But it's only through God's saving grace that we have that desire not to sin. It's only by the Holy Spirit working in our lives, convicting us, convicting our heart, that we're able to resist that temptation to sin. So as in one man all have sinned and died, in one man Christ all may live. So in verse 6, it says, Behold, you delight in truth in the inward being, and you teach me wisdom in the secret heart. What's our inner being? Our heart, our soul. Okay. So when we look at that, you know, it says, you delight in truth and the inward being, and you teach me wisdom in the secret heart. Who gives us wisdom? God. God gives us wisdom. If any of you lacks wisdom in James, who do we ask? We ask the Father. Who is truth? God, Jesus Christ. Notice I didn't say what is truth. That's what Pilate said, because he didn't know truth. 
It's who is truth. God is truth. Jesus Christ said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. When we have the Holy Spirit dwelling within us, we have that wisdom. We have access to that wisdom of God. We have access to that truth. How often do we tap into that? How often do we rely on the Holy Spirit? How often do we seek that knowledge of God? How often do we spend in the truth of God's Word? That's what God delights in. Searching Him for wisdom. Searching Him for truth. He will grant it to us if we ask. Those are the things that God delights in. So verse 7 says, Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Hyssop was used by the priests uh, for a lot of their ceremonies, uh, for ceremonial cleansing. Uh, if a person had leprosy and they were healed of their leprosy, the priest would cleanse them with hyssop and blood. If there was a house uh, that had mold, and that mold was taken <laughs> Away, It seems silly to us, but the priest would bless the house with hyssop. Anybody know what they used to paint the doorposts in Egypt the night of the Passover? Hyssop spread with, they used the hyssop to spread uh, the lamb's blood on the doorposts. So what David's asking here for is that cleansing, that purifying with the hyssop, uh, that's a spiritual cleansing he's asking for. So that there's no stain of sin left on him. It's left in him. So we've seen the cleansing of the person, the cleansing of the house. We see the painting of the doorposts. <coughs> the time that David wrote this, people would understand what he's talking about when he says, clean me with hyssop. Purge me. What does it mean to purge something? We'll completely get rid of it. Yeah. If you're going to purge something, you're going to get rid of it. How many of you do spring cleaning and you purge your house? And get rid of all the junk I don't need anymore. Nobody. Because we all like to hold on to a little bit of our junk. <clears throat> but if we purge something, we want to completely remove it. Get rid of it. It's gone. We don't even think about it. It's almost like it never existed. That's what he's saying about his sin here, that he wants to be purged, completely clean, completely washed, whiter than snow. So in verse 8, it says, Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones that you have broken rejoice. Anybody had a broken bone besides me? Does it hurt? Does it hurt all the time? Yeah. If you move it the wrong way or bump it the wrong way, does it let you know it? Absolutely. This sin is like a broken bone to David. It's a constant reminder, that constant pain. Every time I move, it hurts. Every time I think about it, it hurts. And this isn't the first time that... He's used this imagery. If you want to turn back to Psalm 32. Starting in verse 3, it says, For when I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me. My strength was dried up as by the heat of summer. So David's familiar with this type of pain, this type of anguish, that broken bone feeling, that constant reminder of his sin. You know, and he's asking for God to take that away. He says, let me hear joy and gladness. Let those bones that you have broken rejoice because they've been restored, they've been healed. That broken bone has been knitted together and it's once again strong and firm. <clears throat> Verses 9 and 10. 
It says, Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. So again, we see David pleading with God not to look upon his sin any longer. That uh, word blot out is an accounting term. It's basically a erasure of debt. Okay, you've had a debt, it's been blotted out, you're no longer responsible for that debt. It's been paid off, you owe no more money. So he's asking for his sin to be blotted out, for it to be taken away, you know, just completely remove it. And then what does he ask for? He asks for a clean heart and renew a right spirit. When Jesus was preaching and teaching in his earthly ministry, where did he allude to that our, all of our sin starts? Where does that, all of our sin start? It starts in our heart, doesn't it? In our innermost being. You know. If you look after a woman and lust in your heart, you've committed sin. David is asking, pleading for a clean heart, one that does not have sin in it any longer. That sin's been blotted out. Yeah. Remove that heart of stone and place in me a heart of flesh. Yeah. So he's asking for that, and he's asking for a new and renew a right spirit within me. When we're in our sin and trapped in our sin, what kind of spirit do we have? Do we have a spirit that wants to long after God? Or do we have a spirit that wants to hide from him? Hide our sin. Run away. Not acknowledge it. He's wanting a renewal of his spirit. One that's truly going to seek after God. That's going to search for him. That's going to plead with him. When we accept Christ as our Lord and Savior, he removes our heart of stone gives us that heart of flesh and we are now a new creation. We're a new creature. Our sins are forgiven and the Holy Spirit is placed within us when we accept Christ as our Lord and Savior. That's not a whole lot different than what David's asking for right here. Although David would never see that because this was a couple thousand years before Christ. He longed to see that. He longed for that day. Fortunately for us, that day is today. We can have this right now. Let's go on, look at verses 11 and 12. It says, Cast me not away from your presence, and take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation, and uphold me with a willing spirit. So David is pleading with him not to be cast out of his presence and not to take his Holy Spirit away from him. Had David seen what happened to Saul when God removed his spirit from him? Yeah, first-hand account. He saw what had happened. He, a little bit of a play on words. He saw what happened to Saul. Okay. When Saul lost God's spirit, what happened to Saul's mind? He went crazy, right? He picks up a spear, tries to run David through, you know, hunts him down, sends his armies after him. David's afraid of that. He doesn't want to lose the Holy Spirit that God has given him. Again, remember this is, you know, before uh, the Spirit has come into the world to all believers, God anointed people with the Holy Spirit at specific times to perform specific functions and duties. So God has anointed David with his Holy Spirit, and he's pleading for him not to remove that Spirit, not to be removed from God's presence. When we look at, you know, uh, verse 12, Restore to me the joy of your salvation and uphold me with a, with a willing spirit. You know, once we understand the joy that salvation brings, we shouldn't be hasty to lose it. You know, we don't want to, not that you can lose your salvation, but you can lose that relationship with God. When you've had that close relationship to God and you've lost it you know it 
You feel it in your heart. You feel it in your spirit. You feel it in your soul. Yeah. We need to take time to draw on that Holy Spirit. We need to take time to work on our relationship with God. We need to foster that relationship just like any other relationships we have. If we're not spending time with God, we put God on the back burner. It's something we may get to next week or next month. If you had a human relations like that, would that person still be your friend? If you ignored them day after day, you may see them in a month, you may see them in a year. God desires to maintain that relationship with us. So verse 13, Then I will teach transgressors your way, and sinners will return to you. Who better to preach forgiveness than one who's been forgiven? If you've never experienced forgiveness, how can you tell somebody else about it? If you've been forgiven, how can you not tell somebody else about it? Yeah. David realizes what he has done, how he sinned against the country, how he sinned against God, how he sinned against these people. And he says, once you've returned to me that spirit, you've cleansed me, you've restored my heart, then I will teach transgressors your way. Yeah. He wants to restore the nation back to God. Verses 14 and 15, it says, Deliver me from blood guiltness, O God, and O God of my salvation, and my tongue will sing aloud of your righteousness. O Lord, open my lips, and my mouth will declare your praise. Again, this is just kind of a continuation on from verse 13. But he asked for, finally, we're you know, 14 verses into this, he's asking forgiveness from his blood guilt. What blood guilt does David have? Uriah. Yeah, he killed, had Uriah killed, and ultimately he's also guilty of the infant dying because of his sin. So he's got this blood guiltness, but we saw back earlier, you know, his first sin was against God and asked for that. Now he's asking to re be relieved of this blood guiltiness, of this sin of innocent blood. And once he's delivered from that, he's going to sing. He's going to sing aloud of his righteousness. He says, O Lord, open my lips and my mouth will declare your praise. How much do we want to praise God when we're convicted of our sin? How much should we praise God when we're convicted of our sin? Yeah. When we experience that salvation, when we experience that forgiveness of sin, we should be like David. Except for me, I can't sing. But we should be singing his praises. Okay. We should be shouting it. We should be sharing it with others. Uh, so let's move on. Verse 16 it says, For you will not delight in sacrifice, or I would give it. You will not be pleased with the burnt offering. Verse 17 says, The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. O oh God, you will not despise. Are outward signs of repentance what God desires? No. God's looking at our heart. You know, it's that broken heart. You know, that true seeking of forgiveness, that's what God desires. You know, we even saw you know, Jesus speaking of that blood of bulls and heifers I did not desire, but it's a broken heart. You know, man looks on the outside, God looks at the heart. You know, when we're confronted with our sin, when we've brought face to face with that sin, it should break our heart. And that's when we should cry out to God for that forgiveness. If we're confronted with our sin and our heart doesn't break, we've got a problem. Do we have a right heart to begin with? Do we have a right relationship to begin with? <clears throat> Verse 18 and 19. We'll finish it up here. 
It says, Do good to Zion in your good pleasure. Build up the walls of Jerusalem. Then will you delight in right sacrifices, in burnt offerings, and whole burnt offerings. Then bulls will be offered on your altar. These two verses seem a little out of place. Yeah, I had a hard time dealing with these two. Uh, we look at verse 18. It says, Do good to Zion in your good pleasure. Build up the walls of Jerusalem. Had Jerusalem been attacked? No. Were the walls still standing? Yeah. Had Jerusalem been attacked? Yeah, by David's sin. Was the city vulnerable because the king was vulnerable? Absolutely. But we can also see this in some of the commentators I looked at said this part of the psalm is a little bit prophetic when it's speaking forward to a time when God dwells in Zion, when God dwells with his people. Uh, it says, then you will delight, delight in right sacrifices. Um, when we are face to face with our Savior, will we be able to sacrifice properly? What's going to be our sacrifice? Praise. praise. Mm -hmm. Continually singing the praise of God. Continually falling at his feet. That's the sacrifice. That's that perfect sacrifice. Um, if you want to flip over to the New Testament, John chapter 4. And we'll finish with this. Yep. 19th verse. The whole burnt offering is the whole cow. Well, actually the whole bull. Yeah. Only rich people can do that. And basically what he's saying there with that is people be, will be willing to sacrifice regardless of the cost. You know, if I give a little bit, that's not costing me a whole lot. If I'm giving the whole animal, that's costing me a whole lot. So that's when he's talking about whole animal sacrifice. Yep. We are in John chapter 4. We're going to look at verses 23 and 24. Okay, I'll give you a second, Norm. John chapter 4, verses 23 and 24. says, But the hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such people to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. And this is relating from the story of, of Jesus and the uh, woman at the well in Samaria. How are we to worship God? In spirit and in truth. Yeah. When we look at that perfect sacrifice, that perfect worship, that David is talking about in the psalm. This is what he's referring to. This perfect prayer. This perfect worship. Worship in spirit. Worship in truth. You know, we saw him earlier in the passage talk about you know, having that truth in our heart. And that wisdom. So when we are confronted with our sin... We must first go to God and petition Him for forgiveness. We have to realize what that forgiveness costs God when we go to Him. The weight of that sin was the weight of Jesus Christ on the cross. When we fail to see our sin as hanging on Christ on that cross, we fail to realize how much it costs God to forgive us our sins. So when we acknowledge that cost of sin, we acknowledge that we have sinned against a holy and righteous God. When we seek that forgiveness and repentance, it's only through Christ that we have the ability to do that. It's only through Christ that we can come boldly before the throne of God. It's only through that sacrifice on the cross, that perfect one-time sacrifice, that we can even ask for forgiveness. 
that forgiveness for our sin came through the punishment of Christ. But he's paid that debt for us. And we can never truly experience the joy of that salvation until we give our life to Christ. Till we claim him as Lord and Savior. Lord of our life. Savior of our life. The one who can truly forgive us of our sins. We sing you know, that old hymn, What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. When we sin against God, when we sin against other people, the only thing that can wash that sin away, that can wash us white as snow, as David talked about, is that blood of Christ. So when we sin, and we're confronted with it, we're convicted of it, we seek the repentance for it, we fall on our knees before God, but we remember that cost of that sin. But thankfully, that cost has been paid. Okay. Jim, would you go ahead and close us in prayer this evening?